flame that is in us. Thank you, Kendall and worship team. Join with me in prayer as we begin the uh, fourth session of the Harbinger. Lord, we love you. We praise you for all your blessings. Lord, I pray that you would use me to speak your words, that you would just speak through me. Prepare the hearts of those that are here to receive what you would have us to receive tonight. And I ask in the name of Jesus, amen. In the study, we have been looking at how America is following in the footsteps toward judgment the same as ancient Israel. The previous harbingers that we have uh, studied are the breach, the terrorist, the fallen bricks, the tower, the gazit stone, and the uprooted sycamore. Tonight, I want to bring the seventh harbinger the Erez tree. To replace the uprooted sycamores that had failed during the attack of the Assyrians in ancient Israel, we read their vow in Isaiah 9 and 10. The bricks are fallen, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. The same spirit of defiance that we saw, they're going to build bigger, better, stronger than before. And so we see this again with the fallen sycamore to replace it with a cedar, a stronger, bigger tree. Now, cedar is an English word. And so the Hebrew word for cedar would be erez. And it means a little more than the English cedar. It would be a kind of a coniferous tree, which means it's an evergreen or it's cone-bearing. And it might be a generic term that would be for the pine family. So replacing the uprooted sycamores with a stronger tree becomes a symbol of the nation's defiance. They're taking a, they're not replacing a sycamore with another, but they're saying we're going to build bigger and stronger. And so this became a symbol of their defiance and of a nation's resurgence. It would be like their tree of hope, but not a good hope. It's their prideful hope, their self-centeredness, their godless hope. And so we see also the seventh harbinger is manifested in America at Ground Zero. In November of 2003, two years after the fall of the sycamore, a strange sight appeared at the corner of Ground Zero. Up in the sky, there was a crane lowering a tree. It was a tree that was guided down to an appointed spot, and the new tree was going to be planted where the uprooted sycamore once stood. And the tree that replaced the uprooted sycamore was a conifer tree. It was an evergreen. It did have needle-like leaves. It was the ERAS tree. And they made a big deal about replacing this fallen sycamore with this cedar tree. It was a public event, and it was, this uh, event was led by a spiritual leader, the Reverend Daniel Matthews. And during the ceremony of replacing the fallen sycamore with a cedar tree at near ground zero, this is what he said. The ground zero tree of hope will be a sign of the indomitable nature of human hope. Indomitable means unconquerable. As they replanted the tree in place of the fallen sycamore, they said, the tree of hope is planted in the very spot where a 60-year-old sycamore stood the morning of September 11th, 2001. However, Today, something strange has happened to this tree, and I hope it'll play, but I have a video by the author of the book, Jonathan Kahn, that talks about 
the ERES tree. Can we play that video? Hopefully. We realize something, because we know we have a little Hebrew. The cedar tree isn't, doesn't really say cedar, it says ERES tree. Mm -hmm. And ERES tree happens to be one of the harbingers. So now we're going to bring this thing home. It just so happens, we saw this thing last time, that when the, when the, the Israelites said, we're going to defy God, they planted the ERES tree, symbol of strength where the sycamore had fallen, Isaiah 9.10. We saw it actually took place at ground zero. They lowered down that tree, and you actually you see it there. That is the Erez tree. They're lowering it down into the exact spot of the sycamore, the biblical act of replacement of defiance. Okay? Now, what's the odds of that happening at 9.11? <laughs> What's, you know, what's the odds of every single one of every, these happening? Every harbinger. Every single one. And then the scripture on top of it is proclaimed with people who don't even know it's actually happening. It all happens. And that's an evergreen tree. It kind of looked a little bit like that. That's a, that's a fruit. It was, it's a sign. In, in Hebrew, eres means strength, firmness. It's a sign of evergreen. We're coming back. They call it, this is the tree of hope. They have a ceremony around the tree. Yes. The man starts saying, this is a, this is a symbol. They're talking about, this is another symbol of America is going to rise and rise stronger, come back stronger. But it's a hope that's not a hope of God. That's the problem. It's a hope without God. They call it the tree of hope. So this represents America. Defiant thing. So now, here is it. Now, it down. we actually called it the tree of hope. Yes. America calls yes. it the tree of hope. Yes. So and it's like our hope is, that's a symbol of our hope. Yes. In, yeah. in our renewal. Really, with, yes. With that renewal and coming back stronger. It's, this, by the way, it's a fast growing tree. This is a, it's supposed to shoot up. It's, it's a very fast tree. And so this is a tree of hope. Every one of the harbingers becomes like a symbol. They call the, they give it a name. They give the stone, they call it the freedom stone. They, the tower, the freedom tower. They call this one, the sycamore of ground zero. They call this one, the tree of hope. Everything becomes a symbol and has a ceremony. This one has mm -hmm. a ceremony. Mm -hmm. So there it is. There it is. But remember what the, what this, the sign of national judgment it says, behold, being planted, shall it prosper? Shall it not utterly wither away? What, happened, what has happened to the tree of hope? The Erez tree at ground zero, the seventh harbinger is now withering away. Oh, really? Withering away, utterly withering oh, away. Yeah. You remember what you saw before? It was a rich tree? Yes. Mm -hmm. Look at that. That's when it was planted. Look at it now. It's dying. The, look at that. The people of, of St. Paul's cannot save it. They're trying to save it. They can't understand they can't what out. they can't understand why it's dying. This represents America after 9-11. They can't understand. Remember what we said what the withering tree represents? Oh, God. It represents a tr something cut off from God, and it is cut off. It still has outward form, but it's spiritually dying. And so here it is. When I was there with a member of Congress, very famous, the member of Congress fell on the ground when they saw this. Literally really? fell on the ground, on the knees, on the soil, and it was was in deep prayer when they saw this. When they saw this oh, tree, man. now a re you saw a recent picture of the tree. Shall it not the biblical sign of judgment? But also the other biblical sign is that its bran the branches of the tree representing the nation are cut off. That is the tree of hope. Now they've cut off yes. branches because they're withering away. It's cutting it off. This is the seventh harbinger, the biblical sign of judgment, the biblical sign of a nation to be that is going to be cut off from its glory. That is the sign. And here's something else. That, that, that tree of hope is standing because there's a rope holding it up now. Oh. Do you have that? There. Oh, my. A rope is holding it up. And it holding now, up. This is supposed to be an evergreen tree, so it doesn't... Shed. It's, it's supposed leaves. to always be green, green and always be that. And in the commentaries about the Erez tree, it says the nation, instead of heeding the warning of God, does, determines to rise up in, in its, own, its own strength. It will exchange its feeble sycamores for cedar or Erez trees, which nothing can strike down. Well, that's what we did. And now, though, without anything, wind, anything, it's dying. And I want to show you another thing, it's almost as if it's cursed. Because if you look, when we were there, we were there in September. So everything was green. It wasn't fall yet. Green around. Everything in that place was green right at the corner of ground zero. The only thing that wasn't was the tree of hope. As if that place, that thing was cursed. It was brown, withered. Everything around it was, was except, now let me tell you, there, there are bushes that come forth from that tree. There's 10 bushes planted. And they're all in a row. The 10, the ten bushes 
The five that are away from the tree are green. The five that are near the tree are brown and dying. Look at it. Look at that. Oh, wow. Now that's scary. Anybody knows prophetic look, things? Look at, look that's at that. scary, folks. Look at that. <laughs> Everything is cursed. In fact, if you even look at the bottom of that tree, even the weeds are dying. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how, that's how cursed this thing is. At the corner of ground, look at that, at ground zero. And they can't save it. And, the, and, the, and you see that there again? And, I mean, and it's so dramatic. If you look at the bush, you look at one bush next to the next, you see one is alive and the other is dead. And that is the biblical is sign. That, does that ropes symbolize something to you? That it's, well, the Lord gives that as a sign of judgment, saying, this thing, you're holding it up, it's, it's tottering, it's going to fall. It's, gonna, it's, <laughs> it's being held up, you know, and there's no strength in it. It's being held up, propped up, it's going to fall. And the other thing is, since 9-11, we've never gotten out of it. It's never been that we were released. There's 9-11, then came the economy, and we are still under this cloud. We have never, and it's like this tree. And spiritually, we just saw what happened recently when America chose the, a way of, and very dramatically. So our tree of hope is dying. That's a pretty ominous warning, but that's our seventh harbinger. There is an eighth the utterance. Natural, national pride is usually more arrogant in the capital city of a nation. And in ancient Israel, that would have been Samaria. But in the United States, it's going to be Washington, D.C., our capital city. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 9 again, but let's look at the verses 8 and 9 prior to the vow. The Lord has sent a message against Jacob. It will fall on Israel. All the people will know it, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say with pride and arrogance of heart, and then we know after that it's the bricks have fallen. In the days of Isaiah, the vow itself was proclaimed and it would be proclaimed by the nation's leaders in their capital city. It would be given a voice a vow. It would pronounce judgment. The nation's leaders pronouncing judgment on their nation. The eighth harbinger, the vow itself, in the aftermath of the calamity, they would have made the vow. This utterance took place during the final stages of a presidential election. The candidate campaigning on the Democratic tip, ticket for the vice presidency, a senator, was at the time a member of the Senate. And on September 11, 2004, this candidate had been invited to speak at a gathering of a congressional caucus on the anniversary of 9-11. And what would proceed out of his mouth was even more precise and eerie than the words spoken over the freedom stone. On the third anniversary, these are the exact words that were said. He started out, good morning. Today, on this day of remembrance and mourning, we have the Lord's word to get us through. The bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. The senator pronounced the vow and judgment when he proclaimed Isaiah 9:10, and the utterance would join ancient Israel's invasion to 9-11 and America's defiance in the face of God. There are over 30,000 verses in the Bible, but this one verse was chosen. His entire speech emanated out of this ancient prophecy and revolved all around it. He said, let me show you how we are building and putting cedars in those three hallowed places. And in a place where smoke once rose, you and I will see that cedar rising. You will see that while those bricks fell and the sycamores cut down, our people are making those cedars rise. Referring to America's campaign to defy the calamity, he links it all 
to the judgment of ancient Israel. And then he crowns it with his final in dramatic inclusion when he says, the cedars will rise, the stones will go up, and the season of hope will endure. So on the anniversary of 9-11, an American leader proclaimed the vow, pronounced judgment on his own nation without having any idea what he was doing. In fact, nobody had any idea what they were doing when all of these pieces of the puzzle were falling into place. It just happened. The ninth harbinger is the prophecy. Isaiah 9, 10 exists in two realms. One is the voice of a nation proclaiming a vow in defiance to God. The other is the voice of the prophet Isaiah, who is God is speaking through him. It's prophecy, and as prophecy, it's a judgment of the nation's defiance and arrogance. It's a warning. The vow sets the nation on a course of defiance toward judgment, and the words of the vow become a prophetic revelation given to the nation as a whole. The leaders of ancient Assyria first uttered their vow of defiance right after the calamity of the Assyrian attack. So too, the American leaders stated their vow of defiance on September the 12th, 2001, the morning after the attack. The United States Senate and the House of Representatives convened to issue a joint resolution responding to 9-11. It was the nation's official response to the calamity. While the smoke was still hovering over ground zero, the American government prepared to deliver their response to 9-11 before the nation and the world, and the Senate Majority Leader made his way to the podium to present it. And then I have the video of this resolution, if you could play that losses of those that have suffered. I know that there is only the smallest measure of inspiration that can be taken from this devastation. But there is a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this. The bricks have fallen down but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. That Blindly, having no idea what he was pronouncing, he was delivering what he said, an inspiration, an inspirational speech. But do you know what the word prophecy means? In Hebrews, it means an utterance of divine inspiration. And you may say, well, this senator is not a prophet. He's not even a preacher. Well, if you look at John 11, 49 and 50, it says, Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. This was a prophecy about Jesus. This was the high priest who was wanting to have him killed. But he had divine inspiration. During this vow that, this Senate, that the uh, majority leader made, and this utterance, this prophecy over America was through divine inspiration. As Isaiah's recording of the vow was transformed into a matter of national record and a prophetic word for all the people, so now these very same words are now officially recorded in the 107th Congress as a matter of national record. The Senate Majority Leader intended to inspire, but what he did was readdress the prophecy of Isaiah. In verse 8, it's addressed to Jacob, to Israel, to Ephraim, and to Samaria. 
But now the same prophecy, the same message is about to be given prophetically to a different people and a different nation. He readdressed the message when he said, there is a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this. And then he quoted the judgment of Isaiah 9 and 10. But then he added his own words to the end when he said, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have failed, but we will replace them with cedars. This is what we will do. This changed the vow from ancient Israel to the people of America. The act of national defiance was taking place not in the capital of an ancient kingdom. It's now transpiring in Washington, D.C. It's now playing out in the capital of our nation. And when the Senate Majority Leader brought it to its logical conclusion, this is what we will do. We will rebuild. We will recover. When he proclaimed this that day on 2001, he had no idea that in 2003 that a crane would bring a 20-ton gazette stone called the Freedom Stone to ground zero. He did not know that a cedar tree would be lowered down and planted in the place of a sycamore tree. He didn't even know about the sycamore tree on that day. But it is all recorded in the 107th Congress for the whole nation to know. According to the Bible, a judgment can't be passed unless it's confirmed by two witnesses. This is found in Deuteronomy 19.15. It says, one witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. The Senate Majority Leader was the first witness. The second was the Vice President candidate three years later. Both spoke the same words. If America is following the same pattern as ancient Israel, witnessing the same signs, uttering the same words, reenacting the same acts, responding with the same response, how are we going to escape suffering the same judgment? What about America? What does the future hold for our nation? Well, next week we'll talk about there comes a second. You know, this is not the first time there's been a preacher or a prophet talk about the coming judgment of America. Many of you have seen, even in 1973, David Wilkerson's vision. Has anybody seen that yet? Well, you can see it coming true. And, but he wasn't the only one. Every decade, there seems to be a, a period in America where we are, have preachers tell us, if you don't turn from your sin, if you don't stop sinning, there's going to be judgment. But what happens is we shut down that voice. It's just like the serpent in the Garden of Eden. It says he, he beguiled Eve. He was beguiling. And he twisted the words to her and said, you won't die. God knows you have the same knowledge as he has if you eat of this tree. That same beguiling voice that deceived Eve is deceiving the world, and it's not just America. By being tolerant of sin, being politically correct, is causing the uprooting of our nation. Our leaders are hypnotized in fear of the media and the loud voice of the deceiver. Jude 10 tells us, these people slander what they don't understand. This is the devil's tactics from day one. He hasn't changed. He hasn't varied any at all. 
people just keep falling for it. Sometimes we want to look back and we want to blame Eve and say, if you hadn't listened, we wouldn't be in this mess. But we keep listening. We keep falling for that same beguiling trick, that same deceived voice. We keep falling for it. But we, being born again, we have the Spirit of God in us to lead us, to guide and direct us, to tell us what is truth. And I loved what the um, pastor said, Pastor Rick said Sunday, about when you have the Spirit of God, you can go and you can say, I don't, I don't understand what is going on. Can you tell me, how should I believe? How should I think in this matter? And the Holy Spirit will enlighten you. He will tell you. I have had to go to him on a couple of social issues in my life. Because the media and the world can make it be so deceptive and beguiling to where you think, I do hear their side of the story. But it doesn't... Some you know that feeling something doesn't quite line up with it? I have had to go to the Lord and say, Lord, reveal this to me. Show me what you think of this matter. And every time, he will show me. He will let me know without any doubt what his heart is. Because just like we sang tonight, we need to get back to the heart of worship. Because it's all about Jesus. There is no way that we're going to stand in the days coming. No way. Unless we stay close to the Lord. Unless we continue to encourage each other and spur one another on. Like John was saying, I feel like every Wednesday night, if I have an opportunity to be here, that it is imperative that we end at this altar, that we take this midweek time to pray for each other and to love each other and encourage each other. And so tonight, this is what I feel like the Lord would have me do. I asked Rick and Kendall to come back to sing the worship songs, and I invite you to stand and to join me in the altar if you do not feel the need or you can't stay to pray, then I would say this would be the time you're dismissed. But if you have a need, if you want us to pray for you, then come on up here and so we'll know who you are. You come up first if you have a need. If you need the body of believers to pray for you, you come up first. Does anybody have a need? If not, then we'll just go ahead and I invite you to come up here and let's end in prayer and let's pray for each other around the altars. Lord, we just thank you. I praise you. I thank you that you love us and you care enough about us to send us your word and your spirit, Lord, so that we can have knowledge, we can have wisdom, we can know the truth. Lord, I pray for strength that you would touch each one, Lord, that you would build us up in our faith, Lord. Yes, we just praise you, Lord. Yes, Lord, thank you, Jesus.